he says that uh, the Norwegian I mean, the one question that probably is uh, urgent uh, for me right now is uh, what are your thoughts, wild or accumulated over the years, about African nationalism? Well, first of all, I see myself as a pan-Africanist. Okay. And that obviously is an inclusive term Yo. which into... And into that envelope, you could actually put a number of things. For example, I don't see myself as a Somali as much as I see myself as an African. Uh, one is through choice. The other one is via birth. I was born a Somali. I cannot make that, unmake that choice. Absolutely. But in the same way as one chooses friends and not one's parents, I have also chosen to be a Pan-Africanist, accepting the continent as one place in which I feel most comfortable. And because of this, when I was a lot younger and then discovered through various situations that I could not go and live in Somalia, I gave an interview in which I said, I would turn the continent of Africa into my country and then, as a consequence, lived in about 10, 12 countries. So I'm one of those who's seen the continent from its different perspectives, having lived in these different regions and having also tried to learn as many of the languages as possible, tried to learn uh, Wolof, uh, Hausa, uh, when I was at Makerere many, many years ago, I tried to learn uh, Kiswahili or Swahili. And the idea is I have never seen the continent as political units structure. created through the mapping of Europe. So, so in a way, uh, the, the, your celebration of Pan-Africanism is more cultural, less political. Less political because I have my misgivings about the worthiness of celebrating uh, the politics and all the economics of many of the African countries. Uh, and the reason is because we tend to be more corrupt in our everyday politics in Africa. Uh, we tend to think, to believe in the proverb that uh, if there is a drum, the drum must be either in your hands or in the hands of a relative. Okay. Never in that generic uh, person, okay. you know, politician who, because we have no trust in one another and we've shown in many different ways why we do not trust one another. When I first published my, started publishing novels, I was actually accused of being anti-nationalist in the sense that uh, I am not one of those, I have never celebrated the so-called political independence, because there was no reason to celebrate it, and because there was no independence in any case. Everything was, to every African politician, someone was dictating, uh, you know, telling them what to do and the routes to take. My idea has always been to focus on the individual and not only on the individual but the, the individual in a family unit and specifically the Somali family unit you would discover that there is stark absence of equality among the members of that small family unit and if there is no 
equality in the family unit. There can be no equality in the national body and in the larger community as well. Larger community by which I mean the, the entire world, which is a project that I started right at the age of about 22, 23. And my idea was to study how close Africa makes a progress towards that equal uh, existence, democracy, um, you know. Um, can a woman, because the questions that I was asking uh, in 1968 when I wrote my first novel was, is a woman a person or half a person? And the question still remains. And rather than deal with big, huge umbrellas of talking about countries and nations and Pan-Africanism and all this, it would be best if we studied the smaller units and then get to the, to the bigger picture. I'm sad to say that there's very little progress that has been made on the personal level. Let me tell you something. When I hear an American say to me, or a British person say to me, Britain has been democratic the past 600 years, 400 years, 300 years, I usually say, no, that's not true. Why? It's not true because women in Britain did not have equality in Britain in their societies, as individuals. All those years. All those years. It's, it's all, it's contemporary. I remember, I mean, I'm old enough to remember, I'm old enough to remember that the 70s is when the first movements, women's movements, community movements towards, you know, m movement towards democracy began to occur. And all this is because there is a civil rights movement in America. Yes. And the engine that drove it was the African-American community. And from that, the rest of the world, as a matter of fact, have learned, have learned what it is to be an individual, what it is to insist on equality, and what it is to fight for those rights and to struggle for them. And that's why one of, the, one of the reasons why I say, when I'm walking down the street in New York or in Alabama in the States, I usually, you know, pay my tribute to those people who died, who were beaten to death, who were bumped off the bus. In other words, uh, I mean, the struggle to achieve some of these little freedoms is it's, it's, it's kind of a long-term project. Yes, yes. But you know, the sad thing is we in Africa Want did not jump on that bandwagon. And, and because the rest of the world, as I'm saying to you, yes. the rest of the world started in 1968. I was living as a student in India. In India, I was a student in India when the rest of the world, the students were, the young people were waking up to the reality that they had no, no uh, contributions to make towards the construction of their own identity, towards the construction of their own people. And from then on, you actually have stages of, or moments of understanding, the debate being brought forward bit by bit. Africa seems to lag behind. And the reason is because instead of seeing ourselves as individuals, we see ourselves as being members of an ethnic community, being members of a clan, being members of a racial unit, and so on and so forth. I would say that the problem of, in Kenya or in Somalia, the problem of to which ethnic community you belong or to which clan you belong, would become you know, a non-starter if you simply said every individual has a right to make the choices of their lives. Now, you will be accused of uh, being anti-African. I am anti-Africa in the sense that I am 
not one of those who are enamored of the idea of saying that the traditional values that we respect are the traditional values of the elderly Somalis, for example. And I would not want to sit in the same room with them and to debate about the membership of a clan or to debate about whether or not you should uh, receive, you should be made uh, ambassador or right. become a minister right. because clan you elder. belong to this particular clan. Or a clan and, elder. Yes. And I'm an elder now. I mean, I'm uh, uh, 66, 67. But I would not be found, well, I wouldn't want to be debating with some of these people because we, do, we live in different centuries. What is the role of the writer in, uh, uh, in pushing this argument? Well, the role, the role of the writer is to, to dream on behalf of the larger community. Uh, risk being, risk making a fool of themselves in order to achieve uh, something on behalf of the community. The role of the writer is to be unafraid to speak. Now, I, uh, I have been accused, when I first published my first novel, From a Crooked Rip, which was the third novel in, in writing, uh, I was told that I was washing our dirty linen in public. The, that, who's dirty linen? Somali. Somali, that you know. Yes, but Africa, as a, uh, you know, whenever I say Somali, it also represents Africa. Africa. Yes. And one of the things that I started debating about was whether or not uh, female circumcision was something that could be understood as a cultural thing when uh, the victims were half persons, because women were half, a half person in Somali. If a woman dies, if you kill a man, you offer 100 camels. If you kill a woman, it's 50 camels. And right from, right from uh, the age of 18, I kept saying, why is my mother worth less than my dad? Yeah. And my mother would say to me, shut up, you. But the danger here, and I will, I mean, I would refer you to crossbones. The danger here is that at every moment of your life, you are running the danger of execution if you speak contrary. Well, that's, that's what you do. You, go you to run, speak. oh yeah, you speak. You go to speak. You speak, yes, you speak. You speak, uh, occasionally you get you know, into trouble. Very often people will listen to you, they think you're mad. But you know, uh, so what, I'm mad. But people will realize in another 10, 20 years down the road, because when I first, as I said to you, when I first started speaking up, I, you know, Somalis usually find ways of discrediting some of the words that I use, some of the ideas that I bring. And one of them is, uh, he has, Nuruddin Farah hasn't lived in so. Somalia for all these years. I have lived among Somalis and I know Somalis, you know, uh, Somalia has not developed politically and culturally all these 50, 60 years. It, they, they haven't Why? developed culturally. And the reason is because the individual is not supreme. When I was growing up, and this is part of the Somali culture, as a young boy growing up, if I came into a room where my father was sitting with the elders, yes. I would be asked to leave the room. Why? Because there is no communication between the elders, the wisdom that could be learnt from the elders, and that is passed on to the younger generation. There is hardly any communication. There is hardly any communication. Okay. There is continuously tension and stress between the generations. A generation such as myself, sent to school at the age of four, 
and given the possibility of competing with anyone else in the world. And then I'm being held back by my people. But because you belong to the community. Because I belong to the community. And the community, I have to, what I would like to do is to carry the community with Into me. The world. When I see something good, I want to take all my friends to share that something good. Shoyinka or Farah or Ngugi or some of these other writers would learn something from other communities. Then they would bring and say, come and see. Now let me tell you a Somali poet who said, there was a Somali uh, poet warrior called Sayyid Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, the whom the British called the Mad Mullah. And his wisdom among one of the things he said was, he prayed to God and he said, God, either do not show me visions, do not show me visions, or if you show them to me, please, God, make everyone else see it too. The same visions. The same vision. So that I may not preach falsehood. Exactly. So the, 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 we in Africa have a way of pulling down our own, the individual. Every time somebody is swimming above the, you know, not sinking, if we're sinking, we would like to take the individual with us. Does that mean that we might not viably join Other the world community? It's, it'll take us a lot longer. It'll take us a lot longer. It'll, it'll insist, for example, that uh, it's quite ridiculous when you think of it, that we're actually celebrating uh, the fact. 50 years and only two women president, you see, because the women are not in competition. They're not considered to be equal. There's everything wrong with that particular thing. And I remember, you know, my father, uh, young, uh, I have younger sisters and my father I remember saying why are you spending so much money on educating these young women they'll get married to somebody else they're not part of your family so to speak I mean talking about the traditionalists as somebody who uh, who's a, a graduate work uh, 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 postgraduate work was mainly on studying uh, what is called popular literature, popular culture. Um, I, I was interested in a comment you made before we began the interview about uh, many African writers falling victims of their own newly found status. Um, and here I'm thinking about young African writers. What do you see as uh, the, the task of the younger generation? of the 21st century generation in, in what is their task? The older generation benefited from African nationalism to the extent where when the series of African, the African Writers series were being published, even the publishers started a project in which they said, we must have one Senegalese, we must have one Somali, we must have one Ethiopian, and so on and so forth. So the project was to create a national syllabi where you could have textbooks by these authors. Now, more and more of the older generation of writers fit into that label in which they wrote for the school, you know, the, the textbook market. And many of them avoided anything that was controversial. And the first person who started, you know, there are few Africans who are not as highly respected as some of the less controversial authors, like Ayuko Ama, who dared to challenge some of these traditions. 
then came because I became, you know, in a way, my own generation. Because I didn't fit in with the older generation. And I didn't fit in with the newly, uh, uh, new generation. Not for a single moment did I hesitate to write what I felt was necessary to write. And the reason is because right from the start, I believed in the supremacy of the individual and in the supremacy of one thinking fearlessly. My problem with the younger generation is that they become too famous too early. And then they believe their fame, their own fame. They do not take writing as seriously as they take their own fame or their place in society. Writing requires humility. The artist requires, you know, writing requires humility. It requires a certain uh, personal integrity. However, in the, and I would actually suggest that it requires quiet integrity, not noisy integrity. What do you mean by quiet integrity? Do your own job. Let the rest of the world judge you. Pretend you're dead, actually, that the book is alive, rather than saying, I am alive and singing your own praises. You say, you do your own job. You do your own job. Uh, aren't they just victims of... Uh a much more globalized I don't believe, world. I don't believe in victimology. The media to your doorstep. I, I don't believe in media, uh, in, in victimology. You are, the, the, as an individual with a noble soul, you're the one who determines your own fate. Do you think these writers might just take us away from the nationalist project onto the pan-Africanist project? Again, do you think they will most likely re-ennoble the individual, as you would put it, compared to uh, the older generation's obsession with the community? Doubt it. You doubt? I doubt it. Why? I doubt it because, well, I mean, obviously, some young people are writing, and therefore I haven't seen what they have written. You know, they, they it may... But from what I have seen, from what I have seen, uh, many of them have little or no connection with the community as such. They are their own community. What do you mean? They think of themselves apart. As separated from... I separated from the community to which they belong, and as individuals, they do not have that self-honor that, you know. Uh, it, what I'm saying to you is probably they believe in some of the things that are being written about. So where does that leave African literature today, then? In the doldrums. It might die? No. No, no, no. As long as an African is still alive, it will remain alive. The question is the quality may suffer. The quality, and the reason is because many of the younger generation do not know the African situation, the African condition. What's the African condition? The African condition is that continuous negotiation between tradition, modernity, and the future. Okay. They are not very familiar with where we have come from. Many of them can't quote. You see, take Achebe. Achebe would quote a proverb every time you put him in a corner. You put him on the stage, he will quote a proverb. I will quote a proverb because I know it. Now, in addition to that, 
someone like me, who has had the opportunity or otherwise, of seeing learning, the hmm? seeing the world, seeing the world and learning. I, you know, English is my fourth language. Yeah. English is my fourth language. For the Nigerian or the Senegalese, one European language, one uh, yeah. African language. Yeah, and that's it. Well, I mean, and you know, some of them, if they come from Islam, they gain something else. You know, there is something. I'm not advocating for Islam, but I'm looking at it at a, at a, you know, look at it from a different angle. In other words, I know the Bible, I know the Quran, I know the Somali tradition, and I also know India, France, Italy, and other places. All these have contributed to the person who I am. I want to ask you to reflect on the condition of war in Africa and what war has done to Africans beyond uh, your argument that actually Africa has been reluctant to ennoble the human being. What, just a little bit reference to crossbones. Yes, the war is often created by communities. And the individual who happens to be unfortunate in living in it must find a way of surviving. My argument in Crossbones would be there are two communities that are represented in the novel. One of them is the disparate Somali communities. The other one is the idea of Islam and how to interpret it, how to reenact it. The third one that's very, very important is the rest of the world. Somalia one and the rest of the world on another plane. If we take that one first, Somalia and the rest of the world, the rest of the world has lied about Somalia. about Somalia. The rest of the world has insisted to the extent where even Somalis have begun to believe the lie that Somalia is rife with pirates. My, the argument of the book is that there are no pirates in Somalia. And so when the Somali government says, we're going to do this with the pirates, we're going to do this, I'm saying to you the Somali government has actually believed what the European journalists and the European uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, have believed. There are no pirates in Somalia. You have to find another word to describe what they are, but they're not pirates. The other thing is the self-serving attitude of describing Somalis as pirates and then not talking about some of the other terrible things that have been done to the Somali Sea. You know, dumping of this and toxic, waste. toxic waste and, you know, the, 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 the flotilla, the flotilla of nations with their armor, uh, armed uh, navies, uh, protecting their own uh, ships, fishing illegally in the country, and so on and so forth. So in that same way, if you were to study colonialism when it was being practiced in its raw form, something similar was happening at that time. Something was, we were being told we were being civilized. These were civilizing missions. And yet what were we getting? We were not getting civilized missions. We are now getting, Somalis are full of pirates. And when people meet me in New York or Paris or Rome, they say to me, where are you from, Somali? How are the pirates doing? <laughs> <laughs> now what's your word, your last word? This. My last word is I am um, I'm very happy that the debate is on about Africa and how to take it forward. That debate has to be taken very seriously. And then the, I would still insist that you will, Africa will get somewhere if the individual is honored, ennobled allowed to live an honorable life. Why can't we be less xenophobic? You know, in other words, 
Why can't we know our own continent? If I meet a Kenyan now and they say to me, where are you from? And I say, I'm a Somali. They think I'm a Somali who, you know, uh, came from somewhere, refugee or so on and so forth. The Somali, Kenyans are next door. You know nothing about Som Somalis. You know nothing. And in fact, many of them don't even know or realize or recognize, whichever word you want to use, that there is a large community of Somalis who are Kenyan. They've never been Somali. I mean, they are Somali, but, you know, ethnic Somalis. But they're Kenyan. And yet, every, most Kenyans think that Somalis have come through the border, you know, over the border. And then they should go back to where they came. What I'm saying to you, we need, there is plenty of work to do amongst us. To become African enough. To become African, to become African enough, to, to proud enough of our Africanity. 